What's up, YouTube? I am very excited to be with Dr. Jamie Clark Souls today, and we're going to be speaking about women in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Um, if you're like most people involved in ministry, you'll find that women are either in leadership or that women are supporting a lot of the people who are in leadership in ministry, and that when you preach a sermon on Sunday or Friday or whenever it is that you have your services, the majority of the people that you're talking to in your church are women. But if you're like me, I mean, when you read through scripture, you may not be asking yourselves, well, how would a woman read this text? That text, how would she relate her experience to what's going on to the experience of women in this text? And so that's what I'll be speaking about, Dr. Uh, that's what I'll be speaking about today with Dr. Clark Souls, because I had no idea how many uh, different dimensions of the text that I was just not looking at until I read her book, uh, Women in the Bible. But before I get into that, I just want to let you guys know that by clicking any of the links in the description, uh, you can find out ways to support me in furthering my education, uh, specifically the GoFundMe link, but also the links to the books, um, some of the books that Dr. Clark Souls has written. So with that out of the way, uh, Dr. Clark Souls, would you just uh, begin by telling us a little bit about your academic background and uh, what raised your interest in the topic that we're going to be talking about today? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Nicholas, for having me. I'm excited about the conversation. Uh, so I am professor of New Testament at Perkins School of Theology. I am the director of the Baptist House of Studies here at Perkins School of Theology. So I've been here for my entire career since graduating from Yale in 2000. So um, I love being here. I love my students. I love what I do. So I teach, I write, I speak uh, pretty broadly. So that's what I do. Uh, how I got interested in the subject, honestly, is I was approached by Westminster John Knox to write this book. So they have a series that uh, people are used to preaching and teaching. They know the interpretation commentary series. Well, they then just decided to develop some supplemental volumes dedicated to individual topics. So they asked me to write this one. So honestly, that's how I came to the subject. I was invited to write on it. Yeah, and you say it was a 10 year project? It took 10 years. Yes, I wrote a couple of other books along the way uh, because as you know, and now you've read through, it's a very large topic. Uh, and I had to do, a, a lot has actually been written on women in the Bible in the last decade, um, 10, 10 to 20 years. So uh, there's a lot out there, a lot of great resources, but the subject is a complex one and it starts from Genesis and goes all the way to Revelation. Yeah. I'm a New Testament scholar. Uh, by trade. Yeah. So also really digging in in a different way to the Old Testament texts. Um, gotcha. You know, I wanted to give it proper time. So long project, yeah. uh, my heart and soul is in it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for most people, we'll, we'll talk about this with the first question, but for most people who want to get an idea of what this looks like as a resource, I would say if you just read through chapter one, I think you get like a taste of everything that's going to be done throughout the book. It's like a good uh, uh, test case of, of kind of how you approach the subject, which I think it was like an awesome approach. Um, now, you mentioned that you're the director of the Baptist House of Studies at Southern Methodist University, which I feel like I'm living in an opposite world because I'm in a Baptist you know, context. But I mean, like I, I read some Wesley probably every single week, if not maybe every day I go to work, I start off by reading a Wesley sermon. So why don't you tell me about your, uh, <laughs> Yeah, your uh, position. Yeah, so as you know, you know, more and more, um, the way forward in my mind is partnership, right? Across denominations, uh, gathering together with folks who have the same values and want to kind of serve the gospel. So to me, a, a, an education at seminary these days is best if we have a variety of folks at the table learning from one another. So the Baptists have a lot to learn from the Methodists and the Methodists can learn some things from Baptists. So we're hoping at Perkins to have more and more Baptist students now. So I'm in charge of helping to recruit Baptist students and then shepherd them through the process while they're here. So, uh, so yeah, it's fun. It's fun, as you know, it's fun to kind of uh, just share our traditions and, and kind of the genius that each of our traditions brings to the table while not trying to, um, you know, say you have to be a Baptist to kind of get it all right. But, you know, we, we do have some interesting things to contribute to the Christian conversation as well. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just want to ask you this because I've thought about this a lot and it's like nobody else that I've talked to actually thinks about these things. What are some of the things that you think the Baptists have to contribute uh, to like the Wesleyan or the Methodist tradition? Well, not to be too predictable and not, I don't think, I wouldn't say to contribute just to the Wesleyan tradition because we also have all uh, denominations represented. But one of the things 
that I love about our tradition is the uh, the focus on the Bible. I, I just I'm not to say other people don't love the Bible, uh, et cetera, but you know the piety typically for Methodists, let's say as it should be, is centered on you know Wesley's uh, theology, sermons, et cetera. So what I love is I just love the way that we dig into the Bible. We just love the Bible, right? Digging into all the details and and it's central, right? If you ask a Baptist something, the answer is going to involve whether you agree or disagree with with an individual's take on the Bible. It's it's certain that whatever you ask, the answer is going to involve something to do yeah. with the Bible and what we read in the Bible and how we how we see it fitting in this day and age or not yeah. uh, to our own context. And I love that about our tradition. Just there's so much in there, right? It's a rich resource that we're all going to be dead and gone before we scratch the surface of what there is in there in terms of encountering God. Yeah, good, good. good. Now, do you guys publish any research from that center or is that just kind of like a, a networking hub? No, it's really it's really aimed at uh, bringing back to students here and then creating a place for their spiritual formation, professional formation, internship, and then moving into ministry uh, leadership positions. So it's really awesome. student focused. Uh, uh, we do do programming. Uh, so we had Baptist Joint Committee come, we had Ibu Patel. If you, I know people who work with youth uh, tend to know Ibu Patel. Um, so we do a lot of great programming. We're, we're doing a program this fall with Baptist Women in Ministry of okay. Texas and also National Baptist Women in Ministry in the fall. So in true Baptist, Baptist fashion, mm -hmm. uh, we partner with a lot of other folks where our values overlap. Uh, but no, we're not publishing anything out of okay. there. And it's not a physical house either. It's okay. really just a big umbrella uh, for Baptist and free church, anybody in the free church tradition. So our free church cousins um, also, you know, are in my scope yeah. of, of care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I read uh, 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 Dr. Daniel Howard Snyder's book, The Radical Wesley. And like, I, well, when I first read that, I mean, like, I just completely bought into like the Wesleyan vision, but then there were certain things about the Wesley, you know, and he's making this case in, in dialogue with his uh, doctoral advisor. Um, I'm trying to remember, but it was an Anabaptist uh, theologian, very notable Anabaptist theologian, but trying to make the case that uh, Wesley, uh, was indeed like a radical, you know, churchman like the Anabaptists were. And so ever since then, man, I've always just bought into this concept, like, well, Wesley was radical, but just not radical enough, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, all right. Anyways, now that, <laughs> now that we're here, I was able to talk about that a little bit. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the first chapter of your book. You introduce us to this woman that you later on in the uh, chapter uh, say, I don't think it's the name is original to you, but um, yeah, the, we call her Justa. Uh, I think it's from Matthew 18. So so would you just introduce us to Justa from the new angles that we might not normally see? And what are some things that we can learn uh, from this woman and about her faith? Sure. Yes. So you're right. That So I use Matthew 15, 21 to 28. The story of the Canaanite woman is what it's normally uh, known as. It has a parallel in Mark 7, but there she's Syrophoenician. So that's the very first thing that tips us off that something interesting is going on because Matthew's version, she's not Syrophoenician, she's Canaanite, which is fascinating because right in the first century, there really aren't any Canaanites. So that's symbolic language. Uh, so I took that, that story because it's got so many layers to it. So the woman is actually unnamed, but Elaine Wainwright is the one, a New Testament scholar, uh, is the one who, who gave her a name because that's one of the issues of women in the Bible is that so many of them are unnamed. Uh, and, and sometimes it's harder to remember a story when the character doesn't have a name, uh, even though the stories are, are powerful. So, so in the chapter, I do a variety of things. So first I talk about traditional interpretations of it. So it's really just a test of the disciples' faith. It's a test of the woman's faith. Um, it's a it's a, a moral lesson about um, humility, uh, all of that. And then I go into what I think is actually really going on in there uh, in a variety of ways. And so one of the things I do is also show different lenses you can use to read any text in the Bible uh, and then kind of try them on for size. So what if you look at the story this way? What if you look at the story this way? What if you look at it that way? Instead of always having this uh, really this Protestant urge, to be honest, um, that's an urge only from the last couple of hundred years to narrow down the meaning of every biblical text to one meaning. And that's just, I don't think how biblical texts work. Um, I think our Jewish brothers and sisters 
uh, even the Catholics have a multi-layered approach to scripture, you know, just as, as so the rabbis have this saying, right, turn it and turn it again for everything is in it and grow gray and older, old over it and contemplate it and stir not from it. So you're right. So I take a look at it from the uh, standpoint of, um, of feminist readings, right, which and womanist readings, which aren't the same. Uh, Love Seacrest, who is um, the president of uh, in, at Columbia Theological Seminary, she wrote a fantastic article on how this passage can talk to us in this day and age about uh, the racial issues going on in our country and how it factors into allyship. So what happens when black readers and white readers read this story together? Who is which character in the story and, and how can we move forward in a gospel way? Because the story, right, is about reconciliation. If people remember, there's a story, it's a Canaanite woman, she has a sick daughter. She, she comes to Jesus, uh, asks for him to heal her daughter. Her daughter is not with her, doesn't appear to be actually with her. She appears to be all alone. There doesn't seem to be any anybody else. I don't know where the husband is, if there is a husband or she's a single mom. Uh, anyway, and if you all remember the story, the disciples, you know, Jesus doesn't say anything. It's completely silent at yeah. first. Uh, then the disciples say, get her out of here. She's loud. She's annoying. Um, the story proceeds. She has this perseverance and she sticks with it. Jesus refers to her as a dog, um, which is a slur mm -hmm. um, in that context. And, uh, and she sticks with it at the end, as we know, uh, Jesus, the, her daughter is healed and Jesus declares, great is your faith, using the word megos, right? So one of the things the story is doing is showing, for sure, if, if you had to pick one thing that it's doing, you don't, but if you had to, you know, she she is most certainly a paradigm of faith that we are all supposed to follow. It's, it's not just a story of, oh, Jesus did something nice for somebody. She is actually the center of the story and she pushes Jesus forward in his own mission because if you remember in chapter 10, he says, I came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yeah. She's Canaanite. She's not of the house of Israel. Yeah. So, wow. She is kind of the catalyst in a way for, or at least a big part of Jesus's ministry expanding, which we remember at the end of Matthew, right? Um, the the, the uh, ministry is go and make disciples of all nations. That word is ethne, where we get the word ethnic, all nations. And she's, she's, a light. She's a foreshadowing of that. So she's a robust, rich character who really engages Jesus, and some would argue pushes him forward to his own understanding of the scope of his ministry eventually, especially after the resurrection when he goes worldwide, uh, you know, cosmic, if you will. So she's for sure a paradigm of, of faith. You know, it's also really interesting, something to be honest, that I also hadn't paid attention to until I dug so deeply into this text from so many angles. Um, you know, Jesus's own identity, of course, is hybrid, um, because if you look at his genealogy, right, he has a Canaanite um, Rahab in, in his own genealogy that's highlighted by Matthew, not by Luke. Yeah. There's four women in the genealogy that don't appear, or women don't appear in Luke's genealogy, which is the only other place we have a genealogy. So Matthew actually from the get-go has this particular emphasis on women. Yeah and their role in Jesus's identity, and then his actual carrying out of his, of his ministry. So, so if I had to pick one, she's a paradigm uh, of faith. Um, then again, there's so many other ways to look at it. It brings up issues around disability studies. So those yeah. of us, we should all be interested in that as Christians, right? Yeah. We should be leading out on anything to do with disability, um, you know, how we embrace and journey with um, our siblings, who struggle with disability or don't struggle, just have disability. So it has lots of implications for yeah. that. Again, implications for um, all of our conversations about race. Again, and, and yeah. the fact that Jesus himself, right, comes from a very mixed background. So he comes from a mixed background. Yeah. He ministers, you know, in a mixed situation. And then the call to all of us is this, this, um, you know, we are all, we are actually all part of God's, it's just wildly inclusive. Yeah. <laughs> right. And the gospel tries to find all kinds of ways in its own language. I mean, Canaanite doesn't mean anything to most people in 2021, uh, you know, until you study it, you just read it and you're like, oh, Canaanite, right. But when you start to understand Canaanite, they're like the worst, worst enemy of Israel. 
right, in the Old Testament. So why does he make her Canaanite? And then to connect it to the genealogy. And Rahab, of course, is a heroine of the faith. I mean, she's listed, I also didn't realize this, by the way, you would think I would as a New Testament scholar, but I just, you're focusing on a lot of other things. I mean, Rahab appears multiple times in the New Testament, um, which I think is is very interesting that she's, she's considered a bedrock hero of our faith. Um, and I hadn't noticed that before. She even appears in James. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so there's just a lot going on in that story. And like you said, what I wanted to do, because I, I couldn't do that for every passage, just yeah. show, look, if we take every passage and look at it from six different angles and social locations, you know, it raises different insights, different questions. I'm not asking you to agree with that approach or not agree with it. Just try it on for size and yeah. see like a sponge and squeeze it and see if something comes out yeah. that makes you encounter God and Jesus, maybe in a slightly different way that deepens you or opens you. Yeah. 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 So, and so for people who aren't probably like uh, familiar with, I guess, a little bit of biblical study. So, so just to kind of take a step back. So you give these traditional interpretations and you don't jettison them. You know, these are the things that yeah. you may hear on Sunday morning and not only are they probably true, but you know, there's probably other places in scripture that also teach these same principles, but then you take on these lenses and I like how you kind of make it. It's like an abductive approach. You know, you're saying, okay, well, let's suppose that this is an angle we can read it from. You know, what can we glean? What uh, significance would the text take on? And if you feel like that conflicts with maybe some other biblical principle you have or, you know, some moral that you think is also taught by Jesus, uh, then so be it. But it's definitely raising questions. Right, because I certainly do. I try, I try these things on for size, and I also have certain moral convictions that make me think, okay, well, this... This um, fits into my, you know, system of, you know, to some degree, you have to kind of say what's going to be a, a stronger priority for me in terms of the biblical witness, you know, and so I do that myself. I don't, I mean, you have to make judgments yeah. about which things are going to drive you when you get out of bed. And so the way I talk to my students about it is I call them thought experiments. We're just yeah. going to do a thought experiment. No one's signing on to anything, right? This is not a public proclamation that from now on, you are committed to this way of looking at it. It's just try it on for size. I mean, God can handle it, you know. And again, at the end of the day, you might think, oh, this adds something. Uh, or you might say, okay, I'm glad that's really meaningful to someone else, but it doesn't really, you know, drive me. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about Jesus' reaction to this moment because it almost feels to me like, you know, Jesus is like basically interrupted by this lady. You know, she's like in, in I guess you could say, the prime of his ministry or you know, even like with Mary interrupting Jesus at the beginning of his ministry at the wedding, you know, oh, we need just water. Uh, all we have is water. We're going to run out of good wine or something like that. And he says nothing to her at first. It's almost like, who do you think you're talking to? And then he goes on to refer to her basically as a dog or no, I mean, he does refer to her as a dog. He does. Yeah, yeah. he does. So, I mean, is he being rude to this woman? So again, this is where I would say uh, people people have a broad range of how they approach it. Because for some people, it's too um, outside of the box for them to picture yeah. Jesus having a moment where he's not perfectly politically correct or perfectly yeah. kind or whatever. So for folks like that, um, who feel that way, you know, they're gonna be more comfortable with the tradition of, um, so sometimes you'll see people uh, say, oh, well, he uses the word kunarion, so so it's a diminutive, it's like, um, you know, little dog uh, kind of thing. You know, for me, if you're asking my own take mm -hmm. as Jamie reading the Bible, who loves Jesus, et cetera, uh, it doesn't really matter if he's calling her little dog or dog. He is for sure, it's, it's not a shining moment. Yeah. Um, kind of thing. So I actually find that really liberating and wonderful that Jesus took seriously and takes seriously mm -hmm. relationship, right? As real relationship and conversation, um, et cetera. So, so it just depends, I think, on what you're comfortable with. So for folks who, who don't like the idea that Jesus develops as a character mm -hmm. in any way, right? They're going to be more comfortable with, well, Jesus is just doing this and it's not as harsh and or it is harsh but she had a lesson to learn and he wanted yeah, her to learn a lesson like that. so that's an option but for other folks who are comfortable with the notion of that jesus really was a human being walking around 
as a person. Yes, so he's both human and divine, right? And as he's walking around, you know, so, so Matthew, because Matthew, the genealogy itself points to, yes, that's mostly Israelites in that genealogy, but you see this pointing to of a bigger ministry mm -hmm. that again, Matthew yeah. at the end of the chapter says for sure, go and make disciples of all nations. But twice in Matthew, it's all, this only happens in Matthew, right? Not the other ones. So we're just looking at Matthew. Twice he says, I came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He has a very clear, yeah. clear mission. And there's a reason for that. You know, I don't want to get too far afield of this particular subject and just do a lecture on Matthew, but right. But Matthew is trying to figure out, which is a great question, by the way. These, these are the first Christians who have to figure out how do you have the Old Testament where God makes a covenant with Jews very clearly? He, God doesn't have like a worldwide competition and whoever's most faithful gets to be God's people. I mean, it's the, it's the mystery of election. God chose Jews. So how is it that the Gentiles come in? It's a bit of a mystery. If you read the Old Testament, it doesn't really look like it's yeah. going to really, right? But then, of course, we go back to Abram. So, so Matthew does a beautiful thing. So by having the, the historical Jesus in his own lifetime, focus on Israel, right? You see God's faithfulness to the covenant God made out of God's own free choice, right? With Israel. So, so Jesus does come, you know, the way Paul will put it is to the Jew first yeah. and also the Greek. Matthew's doing the same thing, to the Jew first yeah. and also the Greek because both of them have to figure out they're very faithful Jews and they're like, uh, this covenant was made with Israel. So why is this becoming more and more? Why is Christianity mostly a Gentile phenomenon? Even by the end of the first century, right? It becomes yeah. a Gentile phenomenon. Yeah. Um, and so Matthew does that. And this is one of the stories that does that because God had to be faithful, so Jesus does come first, yeah. right, to Israel. But then the resurrected Jesus, the ministry really is yeah. cosmic yeah, and all-inclusive. So I think it's really brilliant. Yeah. And so in a way, so so Jesus, I guess you could say the principle behind, you know, Jesus' reaction is this, like, place that there he currently occupies in salvation history. That, you know, right. he's come to the lost sheep of Israel. He will be rejected by those same sheep. So it's not like he has great things to say about them either. <laughs> But, you know, then as he moves towards, you know, the resurrection and, and he recognizes the expansive scope of what the disciples will then as the new Israel like carry out. And us, right? The and disciples us. followed by us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so in a way, in, in this woman's reaction, um, I guess she kind of bites the bullet. <laughs> you know, she says, well, you're right, Jesus. But, you know, like, yeah. even then there should be some scraps left for us. Yeah, no, she's bold. I mean, she is a, she's a strong theologian. You know, it's also not accidental that he calls her faith great. It's mega faith, right? Megos in Greek. It's really interesting because in Matthew, you know, all the stories where he gets onto the disciples case and yeah. says, oh, ye of little faith, which is oligopistos. It's the opposite. So hers is megos, great. Theirs is oligos. And we have the word oligarchy, right? The rule of the few. Mm -hmm. So they have little faith. And so that's also really interesting that the outsider, she's an outsider in many ways, right? Ethnically, culturally, mm -hmm. all the ways you can think of. She's, like you said, a female coming up un unaccompanied by any males. And she ends up being this paradigm of faith. Yeah. Whereas, and not to put the disciples down, but it, it is the case that, that, um, the disciples are considered having little faith and she's, so it's a very interesting for Matthew to do that. Yeah. And I think it's instructive and always reminds me, you know, watch yourself about, you know, you just get sometimes into insider mentality of who's in and who knows things and who yeah. God reveals God's self to and, and who are the, you know, appointed leaders and whose voice matters. It's instructive, I think, to remember. Yeah. Sometimes we create certain categories that uh, God doesn't really isn't limited to. Yeah. And whose voice speaks speaks the truth about God. Uh, so just be be careful and, and look around and pay attention. You know, God's voice uh, and and paradigms of faith come in sometimes unexpected forms. Yeah. So so the reason that we're starting out, uh, if anyone's wondering, why we're starting out with this 
woman that we're going to name, Juice, uh, you know, that's her new name from here on out, is because we think it's a, just a good sampling of, of what you get throughout the book. So we're not going to speak about the number of women and biblical characters that you survey um, and, you know, the different, uh, I guess, things about God that they can teach us. But this is just one example of what that process looks like. So we, we take these traditional interpretations and we say, yes, they're there. But then we also find these different lenses from different social theories and, and, and social sciences that, you know, may be applicable, may not be applicable, but they definitely raise um, interesting questions. So now I want to move to, I guess, more of a theological proper topic. And that is how different images are used in the Old Testament and New Testament to depict God. And so typically we think of some feminine images as being associated with like negative things. So like the whore of Babylon or something like that. Right. And we're not as quick to associate how some feminine images are used to describe God. Culturally, I think there's a gap, but then also like maybe societally and morally, there's a gap there. But uh, would you just uh, give us some feminine images that are used to depict God in the Bible and what these images tell us both about God, but also the, woman, uh, the role of women in um, ancient culture? Yeah, sure. So again, really big topic. There, there are a lot to choose from. Uh, I should also say, so the chapter I think you're referring to when you pulled the question is the chapter called God Across Gender. So again, people are custom, accustomed to hearing a, a, you know, metaphors that God has a you know, military language, um, a lot of kind of uh, male metaphors. Uh, so, so that chapter talks about God across gender. I do want to point out that when I get into the New Testament as well, um, I talk about Jesus across gender because Jesus is depicted uh, as well in feminine terms as woman wisdom, um, and in John as uh, as nursing even, um, and so is Paul. Paul depicts himself and the apostles across gender, which is really fascinating. Uh, so, but it starts with, in the Old Testament, with God across gender, and some of my favorites, so a couple of my favorites, uh, I, I don't know if it's because we're in a pandemic, uh, and people have, it's been a tough, a tough year and a half uh, for lots of folks, so one of the images that I love uh, is God as mourner, God as one who cries, uh, so in the book, I actually uh, have this, this tear jar right here is there's an image of it in the book. This came from Bethlehem and it's a tear jar, uh, which I hadn't heard of before I started going to the Holy Land, doing leading, leading groups to the Holy Land. And there's actually a Psalm in Psalm 56, David talks about God collecting um, uh, our tears in God's own tear jar. And then there are lots of references to God as mourning. And the reason that's gendered is because in antiquity, women were professional mourners. So they were called wailing women or keening, women who keen. And at funerals or in times when uh, the community was suffering just terrible, terrible loss, these women basically enacted the grief uh, of, of the whole group. And God is, is, and there's reference to them and teaching their daughters, dir dirges. This is all in scripture. Uh, so, and I refer and include all of the direct scriptures in there. So the notion that, and Jeremiah picks up on this, not surprisingly, that God is one who mourns and, and cries. And again, it's that's considered gendered. And whether it should be or not, that's another topic. But in antiquity, that was an actual professional role, a job. Of, of women that got passed on and they got uh, trained in that. So I think that's really important um, right now when individuals are going through grief of all different kinds uh, in the pandemic, but also socially. I love that it's depicted as both God in grief and, and witnessing the grief and, and with us individually or with our little family, but also at a whole social level that, yeah. that whole groups of people suffer. I mean, we think right now of people who are uh, displaced, right, and refugees. And anyway, I think it's a really rich image. I love it. I love that image. Uh, the image of God as providing food. So most famously, probably for all of us, manna in the wilderness, but but God as one who provides food. And these are, by the way, are images that are carried through the New Testament. I tried, I focused a lot on images also, some that are unique to the Old Testament, but some that carry through the New Testament. Mm -hmm where I tend to live. You know, and Jesus weeps. If you remember at Lazarus's tomb, oh, yeah. there, are prof there, are, there are people mourning there. There's reference to them. Those would have been some of the professional mourners, but Jesus himself weeps there. 
So that carries into uh, to Jesus. There's also, you remember the letter of tears Paul sends to the Corinthians? We, we call it the letter of oh. tears. Yeah, so Paul is depicted as crying. And that's really interesting because they are very boldly identifying with the feminine in that way, right? Because it could be, it's just, I would, I would argue actually even today, that's a different subject that I still don't know if we're to a place where men are just as invited uh, to, to cry mm -hmm. and to express that kind of grief. Uh, so the feeding piece, I love that. And that was also associated in antiquity. Women made bread. They actually made beer, by the way. Women were the first in antiquity. They made, because um, bread and beer, yeah. dang, I don't know, I'm not a beer drinker. Um, <laughs> so I don't know, but I, somehow they're related uh, food-wise. So, so when God is depicted that way, but then God's also depicted actually as a mother. So a mother in labor and then a mother who nurtures. Um, and then there are lots of other things, but, but you asked me to pick out a few. And um, I think those are incredibly rich because, again, they show God across gender, right? If we are made in, the, if it's Imago Day and we are all made in the image of God, then it only makes sense for God to be depicted and presented in ways that, uh, that reflect the variety of us yeah. as human beings, right? And so I think, I think it's very rich. Um, yeah and shows God to be bigger. I just think, I'll speak for myself, I don't know what the urge is, but there's some kind of urge to get God into small, containable, like five things that God is. Yeah. yeah. Because my brain is finite, my life is finite. Yeah. You tend to kind of want to put God into something a little bit more manageable. And instead, what scripture tends to constantly do once you dig into it and slow down and just read little bits at a time instead of you know, read Bible through the year, which is a great thing to do. But sometimes when I'm doing that, I kind of like, I want to check that box for the day, yeah. you know, but if you really slow down and really let yourself just do little pieces of scripture, you start to see a rich array of images for God that I don't actually think we're capitalizing on. Yeah. Gather worship in our personal um, devotionals and, and we're, we're worse for it. Yeah. Yeah, so you have these different images um, that the Bible associates with God, and, you know, rightly or wrongly so, um, you know, most of us don't pick up on them. For me, it's just a cultural gap, because one of the things I was thinking through as I was reading this is, oh, I just didn't really understand the, the role of women, and I, much less, like, the role of most men, you know, other than what the Bible is talking about in right. ancient culture. So I wouldn't catch the connection between well, wailing even, women and God mourning. You know? Well, and what about the goddess Potter? You know, until I was studying, so Carol Meyer has written a really great book called Rediscovering Eve, where she really, she's the premier person archaeologically and, and all of that, and talking about what ancient women did, right? So the pottery was done by women, right? Again, they're all, because they lived communally, right? She has great, you can see how houses were set up, and everybody worked in cooperation, right? You share the pottery wheel or whatever. No, not people don't, don't have the kind of money, and they don't live that way, where everybody's got their own, like us, you know, with our, everybody has their own TV. No, there's one, and people come together, and they work together. They do everything together. They watch children together. Um, and so women are also potters. And so I had never, I don't know why, honestly, but I use the image. I love the image of God as potter. It speaks to me personally. But I had no idea that that, that was something women were potters. And the other thing I think that I go teach in churches all the time, uh, teach and preach. Um, and one thing I noticed, even though woman wisdom, so Proverbs 8, I mean, she's everywhere, right? Uh, so so she helps she helps God co-create the word. Proverbs 8, if you don't know woman wisdom and you're listening to this, go read your Bible, read Proverbs 8. So she helps God. She's there in the beginning and she helps God create the world. And her one of her big things in life is to try to teach human beings wisdom. Now, unfortunately, human beings, we don't always love wisdom. We scoff, we laugh to our own detriment. She's a fantastic figure. And again, the New Testament picks up on all of that and applies all of that to Jesus, right? Yeah. Jesus, especially like the prologue to John, Jesus helps create the world. Jesus is here to teach and free us if we would all get wisdom and listen, but we're distracted, we have idols, you know, we fall asleep, things happen. Yeah. So sometimes people think, oh, wow, you're coming in here with some kind of, um, I don't know, feminist agenda kind of thing. First yeah, one, yeah. feminist agenda, I, I adopt that just fine. But in this case, actually what I'm trying to do is show people what's in their scripture. Yeah. Now we can talk about what it means today and what 
what's helpful, what's not helpful. But really my first goal is to say, don't, don't listen to me and don't trust me on this. Go look for yourself and read yeah. Proverbs and yeah. you'll see it. Read the prologue of John, read Matthew 11. I'm not making this up. So let's start with you seeing what's actually in scripture. Then we can have the conversation about what we do with it today. And yeah. we may agree or disagree, but first just go look and see that it's there. Yeah. Yeah. I had this conversation with, um, Doc, the other Dr. Levison, <laughs> the, uh, uh, what's his first name? I can't remember. Jack, yeah. Dr. Jack Levison. And we were talking about as it related to the Holy Spirit. And, and he makes a good point at the end of his book on the Holy Spirit that he, he just talks about kind of giving up on wanting to have like a gendered theory or something about, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit. But right. more broadly, I think when it comes to like talk about specifically like God the Father, I think one of the things that really raises people's eyebrows is that we're so uh, used to associating God as father. And that being a masculine metaphor, you know, within the family, right. we, it, it, uh, I mean, unless we're more aware of kind of how the Bible does, you know, so for example, to talk about God as, you know, being a mother or provider and those being feminine things, um, we raise our eyebrows when someone tries to tell us, well, no, like uh, there's more to, you know, the picture of God in Isaiah and Jeremiah for than sure. just him being a father. Yeah, really, father, true. father wasn't a, a, a well-worn uh, imagery for God in the Old Testament, was it? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Well, yeah, not not this. I think I think what you're saying is the way Christians. I think the way we kind of almost reify it, to be honest, uh, is because of Jesus's language. Even like the Lord's yeah. Prayer, right? I think for us, so there are images, but you're, you're absolutely right. Um, it's not as in the New Testament, not, you know, it's not the same. You have God as kind of um, a lot of military type language and you have a lot of these masculine references, but I think Christians come by it because you grow up saying the Lord's Prayer. Anything you say repeatedly yeah. only has the masculine language in it. Um, so no, I think you're you're absolutely uh, right about that. Um, yeah. yeah, and so, I, yeah, I think we can broaden the, uh, because again, it's it's what it's what's in our Bible. We're missing out on ways yeah. to experience God and certain aspects of God, right? Yeah. And we want to experience. I mean, not just know about God and have thoughts and propositions about God, but truly experience yeah. God. And the more avenues for that, the better. You know, the more ways into that for all of us, the better. And some will will be attracted more to one will some of the metaphors will be more meaningful mm -hmm. right um yeah. some of us that others also based on our own personal experience especially yeah. personal experiences with parents for instance yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah good good um so we're talking about different images that the bible uses to depict god and there's a lot of these so-called feminine images that teach us a lot about god's character now one of the hardest chapters in the book and we talked a little bit about this is that the different ways that women are abused in scripture. So some people might be uh, familiar with like the famous uh, stories, I think like in Genesis of, you know, the sisters being sexually abused, or maybe they've read through Kings and seen things that really raise their attention to this. Uh, but you really bring out in this chapter, just the number of ways um, women are abused in scripture. So uh, what are a few examples of this that some people might overlook and how should we as a church uh, process some of these problematic texts? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for asking the question, and it's really courageous of you to do so, because a lot of people don't like to have these conversations because it feels depressing, or let's let's not focus on the negative, let's put, focus on the positive. The fact of the matter is, sitting in your congregation, sitting next to you, um, you yourself, whoever is listening to this, uh, this is a lived reality uh, for a lot of well, people, first of all, but right now we're focusing on women in this conversation. And it's just a fact that um, that this is prevalent in our own time. And so when you create space and give voice and consider this important, you're really valuing and inviting people who've had this experience to be honest in church and for church to start to become a place of healing and not judgment or I can't let people know about that because they might think this. So, so I commend you for bringing this up. It's not easy. It was a very difficult chapter to write. Um, I'm not gonna lie. This is why uh, if you do read the book, you'll see, I say, go with me in this chapter. It's a hard chapter, but I promise you right after this, I will give you a chapter on women creating and everything being, you know, happiness and light. So 
Um, it's, a, it's a broad question and it has many angles to it. So for the purposes of this topic, this conversation, I would say, I would give two kinds of examples. So there are examples of women, um, so intimate partner violence, there's lots of that. Um, Diana and Shechem, like you said, people know a lot of these stories. You know, one of the stories that I talk about a little more at length in there is uh, Amnon's rape of, Ta of Tamar, David's daughter, because it's, it's a horrifying story and uh, nobody comes to her aid. David doesn't care. David himself has a pretty uh, checkered past on this. There's a whole thing with Bathsheba. You know, typically people think, oh, Bathsheba and David, like it's some part, like it's some kind of relationship of equality, right? We all know, in fact, no, David actually killed her husband. Like he is king. No one's going to say no to a king. It's not, not a thing. Um, so people know that story. But I, I go a little more at length with the Tamar and Amnon story because I think even though it's a painful story, if, if people will read it, work through it and talk about it as a group at church, um, some real healing can happen. You can start to understand the dynamics of what happens with violence inside of families. Um, and then a lot of it's sexualized violence, um, but so anyway, at the, at the very root, I would argue, whenever you have a community where there is not equality, and by, by equality, I mean, women have an equal access to power and the chance to make laws that will govern them and their bodies and things that affect their children. So when, until women have agency, they get to help make laws, laws are enforced equally. So any society where that's not true, um, there's automatically built into it, I would argue, it is abusive. It's an abusive system from the start right? Just from the start. So in that story, um, you really, it's very grueling and you see that no one cares. Um, and uh, so I think working through that story and then saying, okay, when this happens and someone comes to us with this story, what do we do and how can we be a community that does, the story does not end like this? That in fact, there's fullness, there's healing, there's redemption. Because here's the thing, here's the thing we all know as Christians. It is true that no matter how horrifying an experience anyone has had, it is true that healing is actually possible. It just, it is, but it has to be in communities where people can be trusted to hold a person who's been through such experiences. So, so I think reading and studying and talking about aloud, not just in your personal devotional in your dining room, but as a community, how uncomfortable it is to read these stories, um, how we can imagine being part of the healing process, good things can come from reading these stories together. The second uh, kinds of, of things I deal with in there, I would say are things at a social level. And again, where you have these terrible things of where the Bible says, God said, go in there and slaughter all the men and take the women as your brides and the girls and they call it rape marriage and it's it's just a terrible thing and to me because because this book this interpretation book is not just it's not aimed at an audience just like here's some stuff that happened in antiquity the whole point of this book and i would argue the whole point when we read scripture is who cares for today what what does this mean about what we do today and how we do what we do today so it's really aimed at that it's not just like trying to be a history book Therefore, I think these stories that talk about how violence against women is normalized, it's seen as it's really unfortunate, but that's normal. When there's a war, women get raped. Um, if, if we can start to take on, why is that? Why have we all normalized? Watch any TV show. I mean, it's very hard to find a TV show, um, you know, especially any of these like SVU, all this kind of stuff. Even regular movies, it's, it's, it's just kind of part of the trope often that we just, it's unfortunate, but this happens to women. It, but that doesn't have to be. If we all choose to, to work towards the gospel and create spaces where that's not tolerated and it's not, it's not even seen. Um, so, so, you know, I think there's the individual, there's the potential for individual healing that individual church communities can help people through. And then there's the call on the social level to act for Christians to actually be involved 
in making it on earth as it is in heaven, truly, here and now, in this place, such that this isn't um, considered, certainly not God, God condoning it, first of all, let's get rid of that. Um, but second of all, where we don't take it seriously. So I think it's, it's hard, but I think these conversations can really make us agents of the gospel if we're willing to have them. I, I, you know, I'm, well, I'm a professor, I am ordained, so yes. I am not currently fasting in church, so I typically am, I go around and speak, and so I'll do workshops on a Saturday and then preach on a Sunday. So, right. Good. I actually have my cell phone on silent. Uh, one of the things that stood out to me reading this uh, chapter was that uh, rape not, might not even be a good term because in this context in the Old Testament, a lot of these women would not have considered themselves to be their own property. So that's a sort of innovation in and of itself that, you know, you have a right to your own, you know, body or person. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't know because I think my ancient sisters know when their body's being violated. So I think yeah. they've had a sense of rape, yeah, but... Yeah, yeah folks writing the bible and for and and certainly the folks running the legal system mm -hmm. you're right rape in a way you could argue just didn't exist if what you mean by it is exactly that where someone has sex with a woman against her will mm -hmm. um yeah. you're right like that's you know you have to pay her dad some gotcha. money or something but certainly not what we mean by it where there is an, a notion that um, there is a boundary and it's, it's been transgressed. Now I would argue women being raped back then knew fully well, they, yeah, they were but like you said, do we create a system? Do we create laws? Do we create expectations that that is actually not okay? And like you said, that's pretty, even for a lot of us, it's more of a modern idea legally that right. That certainly even within a marriage, for instance, I mean, those are all pretty recent ideas. Yeah. Um, to some degree. So, yeah. 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 So it, when I was reading through this, I was thinking of, you know, because at the end of this chapter, you talk about practical ways that the church can process this. And I would highly recommend people look at that. But, you know, I was thinking one of the things that has kind of crossed my mind is being, you know, young in ministry, you know, young as a pastor is that, you know, I don't know if we're involved enough in each other's sex life. I mean, that is like yeah. the men in the church. And, and, you know, one of the things that I've like, wanted to see more of is like, you know, like I have a group of men who can, you know, see everything that I'm on my phone. They can ask me, you know, how things are going with my wife. And like, I would be more than willing to hear their criticisms or concerns of the things they have. But it doesn't seem like that's the culture within like evangelicalism. And, and that's related to probably like just this bigger, like individualistic issue that we have in general. But it seems like, like, uh, uh, like, so for example, like I've told my uh, younger cousin, she's 14 now she lives with us um she's been with us for a while awesome amazing girl now i told her like you know whenever the moment comes that she gets married you get married to a husband who is very involved in their local church and who's accountable to the men there and if he isn't and you guys move you make sure you get into a church where you know your husband's going to be very accountable to the men of the group because say something were to ever happen what usually happens is that men may have support systems to fall back on or they can just leave and then, you know, create a new community, be very unattached or something like that. But the women will be the, end one, the ones who end up leaving and, you know, losing that support system that they should have in the church. And so like an answer for me to one of, well, one step of the, the solution to me is that making sure at least among the men in the church that they are kind of like intimately involved um, in each other's lives and are actually submissive and, you know, revealing about, you know, their intimate details of their relationships. Um, I don't know what your thoughts on that. I'm just curious, though, what they might be. Yeah, that's an interesting subject, and it might vary by different churches, and oh. um, I'd have to give that some thought. I mean, I, so I agree that there, for me, what works is for there to be a space to be real and, yeah. and have real questions, 
and speak with someone. I would be uncomfortable. Sometimes for me, churches step over a line. So, so I think you're right. I have two feelings. We're, we don't talk about it enough. We're not involved enough on one hand to where it's just like a weird part of our life that's kind of, you know, we'll talk about what's kind of money. I think we don't always talk about money either. Um, so I agree with you on the one hand. I get a little bit concerned on the other hand, depending on what it means by someone to be in someone's um, business that way. So, but I hear you and definitely what we don't have. So people always want me to come and talk, by the way, on you know the Bible and homosexuality. And you know, my response to that is I understand because a lot of everybody's going through this in their denominations, but it implies that we all have figured out and dotted the I's across the T's on all the rest of sexuality. You know, so my answer is I'm happy to come and talk to you about human sexuality and the Bible. And that includes all of it. But to me, it's just kind of funny. It's like, you think we figured out in the church how we talk about, I mean, people are going through all kinds of things. There's people who are widowed. There are people who are yeah. divorced. Yeah. I mean, there's so many questions and people are in so many different positions. And like you said, we don't really talk about Yeah. The reality of that and, and the difficulties by the way and yeah. and helping each other out yeah. um with people who share our values and so it, 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 okay it's fine to talk about homosexuality in the bible and that affects a certain percentage but a lot of people are sitting there waiting for a space to talk about everybody's sexuality and how we navigate it in this day and age given given options, given convictions, you know, whatever. So I agree with you that we need to have these conversations and they need to be grown up conversations and they need to not be like just somebody telling you, well, just, and then fill in the blank and the conversation's over, but really yeah. with each other, like you said, like, what is the struggle about this? And because also, by the way, if you get, if you've been married any length of time, right, the older you get also inside of those relationships, those things are ongoing. People's bodies change as you age. Yeah much to talk about and to be real about that that can be beautiful and life-giving and we could be helping each other out yeah. you know um i just think sometimes we assume we assume once people are married to like oh they're married so now there's nothing more to talk yeah, about that's, that's actually it. not true people go through lots of different things physically right and um I, I'm with you. How you do it, I think it takes courage and how you create a community of trust because when you're having that conversation, right, it's so vulnerable. You have to be people who aren't, right, aren't going to share your business or I don't know. So I, I really commend you again. And I think what you said about youth, youth group, I think, I don't know if you agree because you're pastoring in a congregation, seems to me we have catch up work to do with those of us who haven't had this space in churches. But it seems to me if you start from birth with the kids in church from birth and intentionally address healthy human development. Oh yeah. Yeah. All the way through it's, it's a natural part of people's faith life. Yeah. Just like discussing how you spend your money. If yeah. we start from birth, this is what we think of about our relationship with money as christians yeah and here's why we do what we do and be overt and not weird like when the offering plate comes around like weird yeah. just from birth like just educate and be like this is why there's no secret it doesn't have to be weird and awkward or guilt yeah. and these are subjects we talk about as christians yeah and don't always agree on but this is why we do what we do and yeah you know and the bible is part of that conversation yeah yeah no i mean i definitely agree with like the 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 insight, I mean, if there's going to be an answer, like at least my conviction would be that the church is going to be a big part of the answer. Um, right. There's going to be a long term solution. It's going to come through the, uh, the the family. And I think that part of that means you, you really have to be in a healthy church because there's so many churches that are just not situated to uh, see through that kind of development. Like I, I wouldn't even say our churches just because in the life cycle of our church, that is not where we're at right now. You know, like. Definitely, that's the goal that, you know, we as ministers here want to strive towards. But, you know, we're just not in a place where we've put in all of the legwork that would take to kind of create that kind of environment, because it's a lot of work. But that's the kind of the work church should be involved in doing, you know? Yeah, because it goes below the surface. And I also really love what you're saying, because also sometimes we get in the habit of saying, oh, my gosh, 
there's a need for this. So then tomorrow we're going to start a program when we, the leaders oh, yeah. haven't actually done the training, yeah. you know, been through kind of when something blows up and because if, if you're going to make space like this and people are going to come and share some stuff is going to come up and then you have to be ready to find yeah. a way to help support that person because right. I mean, cause you meet once or twice a week, but then how is ongoing care going to be for people yeah. who've had deeper wounding? So you're exactly right. We as leaders take these things seriously. And that means getting training and doing, yeah. getting educated and learning to be, have some really uncomfortable, be in some uncomfortable, yeah. uncomfortable spaces with people, Yeah. but, but be a place where they know they're going to be loved and supported and yeah. helped on the way to healing or helped on the way of, um, of feeling confident about the choices they're making about yeah. sexuality, right? Yeah. And feeling confident, like, I have a reason. This is how I act in my life. This is how I choose, you know, to be sexually. And I can say why. Yeah. Right? Here's why. I'm clear about why I make the choices I make based on my convictions, right? My morals. And for us, obviously, church and the Bible mm-hmm. are part of our answer of why we choose yeah. to do this act this way with our bodies yeah. when it comes to sexuality and it doesn't yeah. have to be just an upbuilding like anything else an upbuilding fun joyful conversation too right it's a gift from god how do we you know that's why i love first corinthians 7 okay paul's like oh my gosh these poor people over here and i talk about that in here because it's so amazing in first corinthians 7 where paul's talking about okay married people because the married people are are not having sex because paul has elevated yeah. celibacy and so he's like wait but not for married people that's different. I'm talking about people who haven't gotten married yet. If they can remain celibate, that would be great. So he recognizes people have different calls, yeah. you know, sexually, but um, he addresses it overtly and in an egalitarian fashion um, as well. What he says for men, he says he says for women uh, as well. So I think it, you know, I mean, he considers it a part of normal conversation for Christians to talk about why we do it with our bodies. If the problem he has with you know, uh, it's men using prostitutes in First Corinthians six. You know, yeah, it's a problem because that's a power domination mm-hmm. interaction. I mean, that's imago day in both people, and that's that's a problem, right? That's not what sexuality is supposed to be mutually upbuilding and person two persons involved, not an object uh, to be used. Um, and I think in a lot of churches are doing. I don't know about where you are, but in Texas. So the the good news I'm going to say is uh, many more churches are being involved in human trafficking, for instance. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I love that. And that's what I call real gospel work. We're not just sitting around having conversations about thoughts about things. It's on the ground healing work uh, involved in human trafficking. Of course, the downside of that is Texas is one of the biggest states for it. So I'm sad that we actually have to have that ministry. So yeah. I say both things at once, but that's the church being the church, not running yeah. away, not wanting to deal with something so icky and tainted. Yeah. It's like, guess what? Because this is a huge industry. And why is that? Because we've somehow made it, it's normal to people to think this yeah. is a thing. Yeah. Oh, well, since the beginning of time, this has been a thing. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be a thing. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, one of the things that I really get, um, frustrated about when reading, you know, like the academic scholars that I love is uh, not a lot of them are uh, practitioners, just like in the the ordinary sense. So not a lot of them are are, are leaders of, you know, communities or, you know, leaders in the church. And I understand there there are different reasons for that. But sometimes there's this kind of naive sense that the church is not doing anything. And that really frustrates me because, I mean, I can think of so many different churches that are healthy like i'm very i'm like an optimist when it comes to the church yeah. and so many different churches that are involved i think of a program right now it's called uh the P- the peace plan um it, it was launched out of saddleback but it's it's a a missions um network that has kind of taken on a life of its own basically but they're involved in education sex trafficking legal work um uh caring caring for the orphans and the widows i mean just think of a need you name it they have resources for you to start those ministries so for anybody who's looking to start recovery ministries, rehabilitation ministries, or just anything like that, uh, the resources are out there um, to do it. Uh, but really, you just need to be in a context where people actually have that heart. To, to Yeah, and you're absolutely right, because I, like I said, I'm out in churches a lot of weekends. And so one of the delights about that 
the reason I'm out there is I get to hear all of this. And what I love is that churches are paying attention to their own context. They're also not being like, we should all have a soup kitchen. They're being strategic and saying, what is God calling our church to do in our context? What, what is our point of highest contribution? And if our brother or sister church down the street, good for them if they're doing the other thing. Yeah. But what is, you know, so I am so inspired by what existing churches are already doing. And it's also important for me because I train, right, seminarians. And so being out in the churches and being able to kind of, like you said, always have that connection yeah. about what churches are doing and what my, what, what my students are about to become leaders in. But as you know, your generation, oh my gosh, I really can't go with all these people who are like, the church is dying, the sky is falling. I'm like, then you should come hang out with my students for one week of your life. And you will be so inspired because like you, you all are doing all kinds of fantastic things and you don't know the word you can't, or did you think about all the obstacles? No, because you guys are too busy actually. Yeah. You're starting also just starting ministries. You're not, I love your generation isn't locked into, you don't dismiss or disdain, right? Traditional church ministries, cause they're fantastic as well. Yeah. But you all are just have this vision to just go out where the need is. You show up. You don't wait for people to come. Yeah. You go there and and you start you start things and it blossoms and it's so inspiring and yeah. and just following the will of God, you know, by the Holy Spirit. It's very so I'm with you. I can't be depressed. I mean, I can't because I work, I work with you, I work with people of all generations, right? From early 20s till you know up to 100 or whatever and people are really following the call of the gospel in ways that are making a difference so we, we've discussed a lot up to this point but believe it or not we've probably probably got through like four of our questions uh so if it feels like a lot guys trust me it could be a lot more uh but as we wrap this up i want to ask you a couple a couple more questions about the new testament in particular so or what are the things some of the things that women were involved in doing uh in jesus's ministry yeah, so that's a fun, a fun topic. Um, so all the things, all the things men were doing is the, is the first answer. So uh, you had women. So Romans 16 in the book, I spent a fair amount of time on Romans 16 because it's like genealogies. Romans 16 is one of those passages where your eyes can just glaze over. You're like, oh, it's just a bunch of names. Who cares? I've read Romans. Let me check it off the list. But it's so rich. And if you read through Romans 16 with this topic in mind, of women in the Bible, you might find yourself surprised by the number of women there and what they're doing. So it begins by Paul recommending Phoebe, who actually carries the letter of Romans to the community. And presumably she would have been the one to read it. Paul would have coached her. She would have been the first interpreter or commentator on, on Romans. People are illiterate for the most part in the first century. So she would have read the letter. So he calls her a minister, diakonos, we get the word minister, servant, and deacon from that. So anywhere a male is called diakonos, and it's translated minister into English, it's the exact same word used for Phoebe. It's not like a special female word or something. So you have women as ministers. Um, he lists Junia, the apostle. So you have a female uh, apostle listed. And then lots of other women as co-workers, people who went to prison. Of course, uh, Priscilla, who's um, big in Paul's ministry. So they do everything. They travel with Paul, they, they're ministers, they're apostles, um, patrons, right? There are women who prophesy. So in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul talks about women who pray and prophesy in church. So they're leading out in church, praying and prophesy. It's a whole conversation he has there about how women should have their hair or not have their hair, how men should have their hair or not in 1 Corinthians 11. But for our purposes right now, you're asking me what women do. They pray and prophesy uh, in the congregation. Uh, they are patrons. So if you read um, in Luke 8, they're women who follow Jesus through his ministry. Uh, women are at the foot of the cross uh, in the Gospel of John. In the synoptics, um, the women are, they're there um, at a distance, but they are there. So women are there from the beginning. His mother, I do a whole chapter on Mary in the book, you, as you know. You know, that came from, because uh, I taught the book a lot before I, as I was writing it out in churches, so I could hear what questions people had, and some things I would find interesting, I'm like, this is so interesting, and people are like, hmm, maybe, but really, would you talk about this, and so I would come home and scrap what I thought was so super cool, and instead, and so actually, that chapter on Mary came, because I was teaching at an Episcopal church, 
and there's a gentleman there whose who's piety, uh, I think he was, he is definitely Episcopal, but he was also going through some Catholic um, studies. He's like, Protestants don't know anything about Mary. You know, they don't focus on Mary, and so they lose out a lot. So she is in the chapter on women in Jesus's ministry, but she also gets her own chapter um, because, right, she, she does the Magnificat, she uh, draws upon the prophets, and she prophesies, you know, really about what God's going to do, and then her own son uh, does it. So, so they do, you know, and then in the Old Testament, you know, you also have female prophets, Miriam as the first named prophet. Um, uh, so that gets carried into the New Testament. So they're everywhere. You have Dorcas, also known as Tabitha, right? She does ministry uh, among, what is, she has a textile. So, so actually provision, as you were talking about, churches that, that provide, you know, show the love of God by actual provision of those who are most vulnerable. So they're everywhere doing all the things. <laughs> everywhere doing everything. <laughs> yeah. Good yeah. So I mean, my real answer is they're, they're doing, you know, what men are doing as well. And, th and then there's also, but there's also those funny moments where, not funny moments, but interesting moments where the gospel writers highlight, like the Samaritan woman, right, who engages Jesus in a theological conversation while Nicodemus drops off and doesn't, or the disciples come oh. back like, why are you talking to a woman? It's so interesting that the authors highlight against their own context. I mean, it's strange in their own context, yeah. right, to say, like, here are women who are really getting it. And mm -hmm. The people we would think to be outsiders, whether they're Canaanites or female or the Ethiopian eunuch, whatever, people who might be seen as like not obvious yeah. are the ones who actually get it. And sometimes the ones you would think, you're there, you're seeing Jesus do all of this. Why are you having this doubt? Yeah. And, and I think it's brilliant. I love it because it's yeah. both humbling and it's humbling for those of us who, who just think we've arrived mm -hmm. and we just, don't have anything to learn from anybody else. And it's fantastic because it reminds us that God's always surprising. Mm -hmm. So, you know, keep your eyes peeled. You don't know what God's doing. God moves in mysterious ways. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Now, uh, unfortunately, we'll, we'll have to stop there, <laughs> Dr. Clark's Holes. Uh, I know we're running out of time. Um, and guys, there's a lot of great questions that we didn't get to get to. I do, I do want to point that out. So, uh, yeah, maybe we'll have to do this again sometime. Yeah, you had, I loved your question. You are so good at this, Nicholas. You ask the best questions. I appreciate that. Um, would you just uh, end by telling people where's the best place they can find you if they want to keep up with the work you're doing online or ask you any questions? Sure, absolutely. So uh, so I have a website, jamieclarksouls.com. Uh, that's the easiest place. It's being worked on, so you'll see that, that improve uh, over time. So you can contact me through there and you'll see where I'm speaking, what books I'm working on, et cetera. You can friend me on Facebook. And then my email, my work email address at SMU is jamiecs at smu.edu. So um, if people read the book, I would love to hear what they think about it, where they agree, where they disagree, you know, what, what I should have included, but I didn't as I think forward for the next projects. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, and if you guys are just interested in uh, continuing to hear awesome scholars like Dr. Clark Souls or anybody else, please send me those recommendations. And I love, as long as they've written something that I can read, I'd love to have them on and to discuss their work. And also, guys, remember, you can click any of those links in the description to support me. Um, uh, don't forget to subscribe. And there are links to uh, Woman in the Bible, which you can see in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, woman in the Bible. So I do recommend. Uh, it's actually not as expensive as you may think. There are a lot of books that we talk about that are very expensive, guys. But this it's, book also, is... it's also available as an audio book. Oh, okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, there you go. So uh, I look forward to seeing you guys back on Thursday. I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Layton Flowers and Brian Abbasiano, two different non-Calvinists taking the Calvinist tulip and saying why they disagree with it for different reasons. If you guys didn't know, there are different kinds of non-Calvinist 